Experience in jungle campaigns has shown that the Japanese field fortifications, camouflaged by the rapid growth of the natural jungle flora, and the Japanese continued resistance in a suicidal way after the military decision has been reached, sometimes makes the conquest of the Japanese-held islands costly in personnel and time. The Chinese, with hardly the bare necessities for combat, and frequently without any gas protective equipment, have, it has been reported, been subjected to several gas attacks by the Japanese. Although warned that the use of gas against the Chinese would bring retaliation by our armed forces, the Japs have persisted in such practice when hard pressed. Since the United States and England are not signatories to a treaty with Japan prohibiting the use of gas, and since the Japanese have ignored our warnings, no ethical reason is involved, and therefore it is only a question of determining whether or not it is to our advantage to initiate chemical warfare. To this end, the San Jose project was initiated. The Japanese resorted to the use of gas against the Chinese only when hard pressed. Our forces are putting increasing pressure on the Japs to a degree not possible by the Chinese army. When driven to desperation, the Japanese reaction against our troops has been a frenzy of attack without thought of the cost to themselves. Illogical and unpredictable, they may resort to gas warfare without considering the cost. In that event, what will be the net result? These and many related questions demand carefully checked, accurate answers. Our own chemical warfare service had little experience in testing chemical agents, weapons, and protective equipment under tropical conditions. So it was proposed to set up a complete, coordinated plan of tests designed to furnish field commanders with the best obtainable data on protective equipment under tropical conditions, and also data on the behavior of chemical agents in case it becomes necessary to retaliate or the decision is made to initiate gas warfare ourselves. It was the decision of the Inter-Allied Chemical Warfare Committee that it be a joint project under the direction of an American officer. General William N. Porter, Chief of the Chemical Warfare Service, assigned General E.F. Boleyn to direct the project, and officers with military as well as technical background were chosen to staff it. English and Canadian Army officers and Royal Canadian Air Force officers were also assigned to the project. At preliminary conferences in Washington, experimental work done by the British at their chemical warfare jungle proving grounds near Innisfail, Australia, and Raw Pindi, India, was carefully studied while the test program was being prepared. During the planning period, the Navy and Marine Corps checked on the program of tests, and the Navy furnished four officers, including three aerologists who worked with the Air Corps meteorologists on micrometeorology. The NDRC offered its services, and the project was very fortunate in having 28 civilian scientists from Divisions 9 and 10 under the able leadership of Dr. Blasse of the Northwestern University Laboratories attached to it. These gentlemen had been working in conjunction with the Chemical Warfare Service at Dugway Proving Ground, Utah, and Bushnell, Florida on similar work, during which time they had developed new instruments and a technique for measuring gas concentrations to a degree and accuracy not before obtainable. Without their able assistance, it would not have been possible to obtain much of the highly technical data which is in the written report and on which many of the conclusions are based. After a survey of the Southwest Pacific Theater and the Caribbean area, San Jose Island in the Perlis Group was selected as the test ground, since the climate and flora are similar to that which has been found in the Southwest Pacific, and supply and availability of aircraft were more satisfactory. This island, which has not been inhabited since 1871, is covered with virgin jungle. San Jose Island is seven miles long by four miles across at its widest point. The main ridge line of the island runs north and south up its longest dimension and attains a height of about 400 feet at its highest points. Parts of the island are broken and quite rugged. There is some difference in flora on the east and west slopes. In general, the eastern slope contains large trees and has a high jungle canopy while the western slope does not contain many large trees and is a tangle of bush and vines at ground level. The island's flora is said to be typical of secondary forests found in the coastal areas of the larger islands in the East Indies and Burma. 
There are a few small tidal swamps on the island, and the weather is said to be similar to the southwest Pacific area. So it is believed that the data obtained by these tests can be relied on to furnish accurate information on which to base plans for possible future gas operations in areas covered by tropical jungle. New Orleans was designated as the port of embarkation for both personnel and supplies. The bulk of the personnel and munitions to be tested, testing equipment, and test animals were shipped to Balboa Canal Zone and there transshipped by barge and small steamer to the island. In order to conserve time required to build a dock, supplies were landed by barge, taking advantage of the large tides that exist in that area. Approximately 30 miles of roads and 60 miles of trail were put through the jungle to enable munitions, sampling equipment, and animals to be moved to the test areas. Part of these roads, by necessity, had to traverse rugged country. A campsite was cleared of jungle and a sanitation and insect control plan initiated to ensure that work would not be slowed down by loss of man hours from sickness. A field toxic gas handling yard was established and a refrigeration plant installed for storage of class one supplies which were delivered twice monthly and for the storage of photographic materials and other technical equipment which would have otherwise deteriorated under tropical weather conditions. The 6th Air Force made the bomber squadron stationed on the Rio Hata Strip available for drop tests. This field was within 60 miles of San Jose Island. Therefore, all air munitions intended for drop tests were stored in field dumps in the vicinity of the runway. The Royal Canadian Air Force made a Baltimore bomber available for testing United Kingdom air munitions, which cannot be accommodated by our bomb racks. The organization of the personnel for carrying on the investigations included the technical group, made up of civilian scientists from the NDRC and technically trained Army, Navy, and United Kingdom Army officers, which conducted the tests, and the command and staff group, which evaluated the technical information from the user's viewpoint. During the series of experiments, the technical group presented the results of each test to the commander of the project and his staff, on which were included the liaison officers from the Army Air Forces, Navy, and United Kingdom. Conclusions were reached and recommendations formulated at these conferences. Representatives of the using arms and services have concurred in all reports. Mustard gas is the defender's best agent in the tropical jungle. As the Japanese are on the defensive, we must continually advance through dense vegetation to get at them, and therefore our first series of tests was designed to discover how effective our protective equipment would be against that agent in both liquid and vapor form. To begin with, the ability of our troops to wear this equipment for long periods was tested. Some doubt had been expressed as to whether the wearing of impregnated clothing and protective ointment could be endured in the tropics. In this test, an infantry company from the Mobile Force Panama Canal Department wore ointment and impregnated uniforms in a two-sided free maneuver lasting 13 days. The men wore this equipment for seven days and nights without removing their uniforms. Two pairs of socks were issued and were alternated each day. At the end of seven days, the men were allowed to remove their uniforms for two hours and take a bath, after which they put the same impregnated uniforms and socks back on and wore them for an additional six days. Each day, the men were checked for signs of skin irritation caused by the impregnated clothing. They were questioned as to the degree of discomfort due to such skin irritation as was found. The final check showed that the impregnate has some irritating effect. While annoying, the irritation was not sufficiently severe to cause any of the men to fall out during the maneuver. At the end of the 13th day, all the men stated that they felt they could continue in the field wearing the same uniform. The protective ointment was found to be soluble in the mosquito repellent, which had to be used each night. This is a serious defect as the soldier removes the ointment as he applies the repellent. 
However, this can be remedied by making the repellent the solvent for the active ingredient of the ointment. Thus, the repellent and ointment can be applied together without losing the effectiveness of either. Men were dressed in one and one half thicknesses and two thicknesses of impregnated coveralls, which are less irritating to the skin than one thickness. Any added discomfort due to greater warmth appears to be negligible. Having established the wearability of protective clothing, the degree of protection it offers under tropical conditions was next tested. Men were sent through the jungle in the presence of mustard gas vapor and liquid. It was established that two layers of impregnated clothing will give complete protection against any concentration of mustard gas vapor that it is practicable to set up in the field. On the other hand, there is a hazard from liquid mustard gas in the jungle for about three hours after a bombardment against which the impregnated uniform will not give protection. From a long series of these tests, it can be generally stated that six hours after a mustard gas bombardment, men with impregnated uniforms can enter and occupy with safety a contaminated area in the jungle, while troops without impregnated clothing cannot occupy the same area for 48 hours without expecting casualties. series of tests was designed to answer two questions. First, when firing or dropping persistent gas munitions on jungle-covered terrain, what effect, if any, has the thick jungle growth on the functioning of fuses on both ground and air munitions? Second, what is the value of the gas liberated? The air munitions tested were the M70 100-pound bomb with the M110A1 fuse and the M47A2 100-pound bomb with the M126A1 fuse. Single bomb static tests were first made to determine the spread and vapor concentrations the munitions will set up in the jungle. The bombs were exploded at various heights above the ground to determine whether there would be any loss in contamination and vapor yield as a result of tree bursts. It was found that tree bursts up to a height of 25 feet gave highly satisfactory results, with diminishing returns up to 40 feet. Tree bursts above 40 feet were quite ineffectual. Small-scale drop tests established the probability that bombs dropped below 3,000 feet should be fitted with delay fuses in order to reduce the number of high tree bursts. On the other hand, it was established that the great majority of bombs dropped from 3,000 feet and above with instantaneous fuses would probably function satisfactorily. <laughs> 